Hello and welcome to another edition of Foreign Dispatches. I'm Layo Olaride. On the program this week, prisoners of war who have suffered Russian imprisonment for months are recounting their experiences in detention even as the Ukrainian war continues. Plus, relieving historical times through the research of Israeli scientists using new dating technology. Ukrainian prisoners of war have been speaking of their time in captivity, remembering the horrors they faced under Russian imprisonment. Our first report focuses on two people who endured months of long detention before eventually being set free. Alina Panin, a Ukrainian prisoner of war, freed last week, recalls women fainting from hunger as they took the 15 minutes of permitted daily exercise during their months-long detention by Russian forces. The 25-year-old was one of 218 detainees, nearly half of them women, freed on October 17th in one of the biggest prisoner swaps since Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th. Some of us used to faint because we didn't have enough to eat. The boys had a little exit to the outside, those that were in the barracks. But we were in the preliminary detention center near the barracks, and our exit was closed. We were led outside once a day for 15 minutes. That's why some fainted. Their sugar level, glucose fell because there was not enough food. She says the one saving grace was that the women were allowed floor by their captors to bake bread. When the invasion started, Panina had been walking in the port of Mariupol in southeast Ukraine, checking ships for contraband. She later helped defend the factory in the city during a months-long siege and heavy bombardment by Russian forces who finally took Mariupol, reduced largely to rubble in mid-May. A former commander, Valerio Paditel, a colonel in the border guards in the Donetsk region, also complained of hunger and general maltreatment during the four months he spent in Russian captivity. He was freed in a prisoner swap in September. Russia denies maltreatment of prisoners of war. It says its actions in Ukraine are a special military operation to disarm the country and rid it of dangerous nationalists. Panina said not all their captors behaved badly towards the detainees. Both Panina and Paditel, who wore black sweatshirts with the words, I'm Ukrainian, said the commandery among the detainees had helped them survive their ordeal. We supported each other in whatever ways we could. We were 27 girls in the chamber, girls from different units. Some cried, some laughed. We just tried to support each other, to cheer ourselves up and to give each other a fighting spirit. When we saw the boys, they told us it was great to see us. Even if they're imprisoned, it makes things so much easier for us. Paditel said the Russians had believed their captives would agree after some time in detention to defect to Moscow's side, but not a single one of them did that. He says, no one lost their spirit, no one lost faith. Well, in the midst of a raging war, Ukrainians in the capital city are still trying to keep hope alive and make life fun for themselves. These people made up the audience as Ukrainian Oscar contender premiered their film at the Kyiv festival despite blackouts. Ukrainian Oscars contender, the film Dyke premiered at Kyiv's annual critics festival in Kyiv amidst the bombing and airstrikes unleashed by Russia for eight months running. 
The film, held by Turkish-Ukrainian co-production crew, depicts a Ukrainian family living on the Russia-Ukraine border when the MH17 plane catastrophe happened. The pregnant protagonist refuses to leave her house even as the village gets captured by armed forces. The Ukrainian film director, Marina uh, Gobak, speaks about the personal significance of the film. One of our motivations for making Klondike was the fact that, in my opinion, as a fellow screenwriter, the events in Ukraine were wrongly named outside of Ukraine, and sometimes inside of it as well. We often heard it called a local conflict, a misunderstanding, even a civil war or civil conflict in Russian narratives. To me, it was occupation, which should have been called a war. The MH17 catastrophe happened when the sky over Ukraine wasn't closed, because in 2014 there was an understanding that occupation had begun. The film premiere occurred in a time of uncertainty and recurring blackouts in Kyiv, but the festival organizers weren't taken aback. We have a generator here now, so, so even if there's no light, we have a generator. If an air raid alarm starts, those who want to leave can leave, and the showing will continue. But let's hope it will last in perfect quality and to the end. Film goers, including many Ukrainian servicemen in uniform, filled up the cinema hall, eager to see the Oscars contender, which is dedicated to Ukrainian women. One of the festival attendees, Alina Zvakova, after the film said that she was positively impressed by the screening. I'm so glad to see Ukrainian cinema of such high level represented on international stages, especially by women. This movie is directed by a woman, has a leading female protagonist, just like the film yesterday. This is incredibly delightful and gives me hope that we are moving at a great pace and even the war isn't stopping us. Klondike has already been awarded in several foreign film festivals and is Ukraine's Oscar committee candidate for Best Foreign Picture at next year's Oscars. How would you like to go back in time to relieve historical times and battles as far back as the biblical ages? Well, Israeli scientists are making that easy as they use new dating technology bringing together historical events. Take a look. Ancient ruins tell only a partial story of the epic sieges and conquests recounted in the Hebrew Bible, but scientists are using new dating technology to piece together historical events to see how closely they resemble those described in scripture. The magnetic field of the earth is constantly changing. We can use this, these changes in the magnetic field as a dating method. We were able to reconstruct the ancient magnetic field that was recorded when ancient cities were burnt on fire by military campaigns during biblical times. Using readings of ancient geomagnetic fields which have been preserved over time in mud bricks from sites destroyed by fire in two collections of ceramic objects, Scientists from Hebrew University and Tel Aviv University have dated these remnants more accurately. We're standing here at the, the, the gatehouse at Lachish. In 701, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, was here, put a siege in the city and eventually conquered the city and destroyed it. This is described also in the Bible and also in Assyrian sources and in the famous Lachish relief, uh, describing the, this uh, event. And uh, we managed to reconstruct the magnetic field of the Earth, which is recorded in burnt mud bricks, like the one I'm holding here. As you can see over there, the burnt mud brick wall. The method has been used in the past, but never to this extent. The idea of archaeomagnetic dating has been around for many years. But at least in this region, it hasn't been done in, in, to such extent 
We have new technology, as you can see behind me, that enables a, a very large database. And since we have a very large database, we can compare many different sites by, according to the magnetic signal, and this way uh, reach a very accurate uh, dating method. The study's finding indicate, for example, that the army of Hazel, king of Aram Damascus, first mentioned in the Book of Kings, was responsible for the destruction of several cities, including Tel Rehov, Tel Zayt, and Hovet Hevet. When these mud bricks were burnt, they recorded the magnetic field of the earth at the time. This helped us, uh, this was used as an anchor for uh, dating other sites. We reconstructed the magnetic field also in other sites and we could use the magnetic signal to, to date sites that aren't well dated with this, uh, according to the data from this site, which is very well dated to 701 BC. In terms of its modern application, Vaknin says magnetic field and its activity is one of the biggest mysteries facing scientists and this technology could be used to predict how the magnetic field will change and behave in the future. Egypt is bracing itself for November's COP27 climate summit taking place in the Red Sea city of Sham El Sheikh with several development projects to infrastructure and initiatives to turn the city green. However, some prominent activists say the decision to hold next month's summit in this tourist resort, along with the restrictions on access, is curbing civil society's participation in the event. The November 6 to 18 summit in Sham El Sheikh is the first annual UN climate conference to be held after the easing of COVID-19 restrictions. Campaigners see it as a crucial venue for raising the alarm over climate change and pressurizing governments to act. But they say voicing their concerns through rallies and protests, as they have done in past host countries or cities, will be more challenging in Egypt, where public demonstrations are effectively banned and activists have struggled to operate legally amid political dissent. Limits on accreditation and attendance badges for activists, especially from poorer nations, have also been a point of contention at previous UN climate summits. It's going to be virtually impossible for anyone who is not accredited for the conference itself to be able to access the city during the conference period. Egypt, which has just one non-governmental organization permanently accredited to attend the annual summits, says inclusion of civil society is a priority and it has helped add more NGOs including 35 Egyptian groups through a single year admission valid only for COP27. Uh, government has made some allowance for Egyptian organizations that do not have observer status with the UN uh, to be present uh, through a process of one-time accreditation. Uh, however, uh, although that was a positive step, um, uh, the government uh, pre-selected these organizations uh, that received this one-time accreditation, did not make any public announcement, uh, did not establish any transparent and fair process for civil society organizations to apply on an equal footing. And of course, naturally, as a result, uh, the list of accredited organizations uh, does not include a single human rights organization. Um, and uh, none of the uh, independent human rights groups in Egypt, including those that are working on the nexus of human rights, environmental justice, and climate justice. Another concern among activists is the difficulty ordinary citizens may face accessing Sham El Sheikh, the city situated at the southern tip of Egypt's Sinai Peninsula is bordered by the sea on one side and a concrete and wire barrier in the desert on the other. Some of those hoping to travel from outside Egypt have been put off by hotel prices that ran into hundreds of dollars per night earlier in the year. It's really bad um, and, and, and I know that there are attempts to try and resolve the situation, but unfortunately um, we're not making progress 
uh, as fast as we're supposed to, because now we are less than a month before COP starts, and still we're still in this uh, big, big problem uh, around access uh, for our uh, our people from Africa. The COP27 presidency, however, says it's doing what it can to ensure that spaces are visible in the vicinity of the conference, provided with all services, including drinking water and shades, for those who wish to hold rallies. And they should be able to coordinate themselves with the relevant authorities as soon as possible. But this month, a group of independent experts appointed by the UN Human Rights Council warned that past crackdowns on NGOs and activists had created a climate of fear and calls on Egypt to ensure safe and meaningful participation for civil societies and every other attendee at the COP27. We take a break now on Foreign Dispatches. When we come back, you could get yourself a paint portrait by Zimbabwean-born visual artist known as Rasta the Artist. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. We head now to South Africa to meet Tando Ntuli, winner of South African Fashion Week's 2022 Young Talent Award, her women's wear label is drawing inspiration from her mother and grandmother to create an intergenerational style focused on durable fabrics and items that can be layered together. Let's take a look. In her Johannesburg studio, fashion designer Thando Ntuli is getting pieces ready for her label, Munkus, ahead of her show at the South African Fashion Week. Ntuli says she designs clothes that are made to last, to be passed down over generations, to be layered and reinvented as the wearer wishes. If I go into the world, I kind of want to use Munku or have people wearing the clothes have the same idea. I can take on the world and still be as comfortable as I want, still be as true to myself as I want, and still have the sense of home, which might be South African, which might be who you are at home, which might be the love or family members give you, but I kind of just want the sense of home to kind of be given or transferred to the people wearing the brand or sharing the brand or speaking about the brand. So I named it something that gives me the sense of home, which is Munguz. The 25-year-old who grew up in the township of Soweto took inspiration from the dresses and skirts she used to borrow from her mother and grandmother in the 1980s and 1990s. This collection is inspired by my mom. Um, I kind of looked into the five personas that my mom represents. She's basically a giver, a nurturer, a lover, a fighter, and a leader. So you'll see the different silhouettes from like suit structure to like flow, free power in terms of color as well. And still a lot of layering, but it kind of represents everything that she kind of showed me in my life and the many hats women have to wear. And I think a lot of people can relate, not to my mom specifically, but all mothers within South Africa or an African context. In April, Ntuli won the South African Fashion Week's 2022 New Talent Search Competition, giving the young designer a platform to show and share her designs. She's also traveling to the Fashion Weeks in Lagos, Nigeria, and Nairobi, Kenya, to show her work there. Growing from home is the best part because that's where you aspire to be at first. If I can make it at home first, it means I'm ready to take on the world. And if you can get recognition at home, it means more than the rest of the world for me. But I think it's always a good push to have people who believe in you and also have your country behind you before you kind of take leaps in other countries. Munku's collection for the autumn winter show is called Umama Wam, which means my mother in Isizulu language. Untuli is amongst a growing crop of local South African designers who are making waves in the international fashion scene. And finally, on the program, a Zimbabwean-born visual artist is making all kinds of waves in South Africa, sometimes for what some have described as the wrong paintings. Despite some of the criticisms, 44-year-old Lebani Sirenje, popularly known as Rasta the Artist, remains undaunted. To show he means business, the father of two who has no formal training in painting, is hosting his solo exhibition at the Museum Africa in Newton, Johannesburg. 
300 of his more than 500 portraits are on display at the exhibition that will end in December. 44-year-old Libani Serenje from Zimbabwe, popularly known as Rasta the Artist, is very famous in South Africa for his portraits of famous people and particularly for the uproar that usually follows every unveiling. This uh people that are criticizing, they made me in a way that uh, when you are always talked to, like in social media, radio and TV, people, they get to notice you. So with the critics that I had, I was just taking those critics that are constructive and living, the ones that are destroying me. So I think I got it from them also. Yeah, big up to them. Um. Haters. <laughs> This is Rasta's first solo exhibition at Museum Africa in Johannesburg. Global icon Nelson Mandela got more than one mention here, 27 portraits in all, and he tells us the reason why. The former statesman, uh, as we know, that was in prison for almost 27 years. So this room also I painted 27. Not I painted, I collected almost 27 portraits to fill in these rooms to show what he, the struggle that he went through each and every year. So each and every painting represents a year of Mandela in prison. Here is Winnie Madikizela Mandela, President Ramaphosa, Julius Malema, and who's this? And who? And who? And who? While we figure those out, despite criticisms, an undeterred Rasta has more than 500 portraits to his name. His determination has scored him a couple of TV commercials, including this hilarious one for a famous fast food brand based on what has become his public given reputation. No, 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 no. They come to me sometimes with that content, with Rasta, we need you maybe to come and paint. So it becomes funny at, uh, on that note, in a way that Chicken Licken also, their adverts are so very funny. So for me also, I think they created something that people they liked the most. With the, uh, Rasta is sketching so badly, so that's why the cops didn't get the culprits. One of those who came through for his exhibition is KwaZulu Natal based sculptor and painter Lungelo Gumete. He came bearing a Rasta as a gift. I told him that I'm going to be bringing your station. He couldn't believe it. He was like, I'm shaking. I'm like, why are you shaking? You always draw people. <laughs> Now that we are doing you, you're shaking. You're like, no, no, I'm shaking, my man. Are you serious? You're going to do a, put a, a stage of me? Like, yeah, I'm going to do a stage of you. And I'm going to bring it to your exhibition. So I did it and I, bring, I brought it here. Mm -hmm. Who is it? <laughs> we had a little quiz for those who came through for the exhibition. Take your pick and see who you can recognize. This one, I, I'm not too sure. And then that one, the power one, is DJ Spoo. Um, I think it's double HP there, and then Brenda Fassi, and then obviously Ricky Rick. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Again, uh, okay, um, down. Um, I forget uh, our rugby player. Forget his name. Away from the exhibition, we visited Rasta at the modest studio where he puts paint to canvas. Inside the studio, we got a feel of Rasta at work. And guess who had the honor of having a spot on Rasta's wall of very famous paintings? Me. And I'll leave you to be the judge if that looks like me or not. He's laughing, so maybe he's going to tell me what it's all about, what it was like painting more. Sometimes my paintings, they don't go with the famous ones also. And I will be trying to make some other people famous. As you are a journalist also, people must uh, acknowledge you as well and know that there is sister that he was doing also good Thank works you. there. <laughs> so without a painting, I'm honoring you as well. Yeah, in this world of 
firm. Yeah. All right. So people, please stop criticizing. That's it. Yeah, she likes the painting. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is me, <laughs> according to Rasta. Yeah, yeah. So you be the judge, whether this is me or not. Amazing job. Thank you so much, yeah, Rasta. Okay. Well, this is where we say goodbye until next time. But remember, our top stories are never far away. You can catch them on channelstv.com. Thank you so much for watching the program. I'm Layo Olarinde.